Hi, I'm Mike Hayden, principal at the Chertoff Group, former director of CIA and NSA, and I'm really honored and excited to be joined here by some really good friends who know an awful lot about Northeast Asia. First of all, to my uh, immediate left, General Walter Skip Sharp, former commander of all U.S. forces in Korea, and to his left, Victor Cha, former member of the National Security Council, and frankly, currently rumored to be the next American ambassador to the, to the Republic of Korea. So we're excited that you're with us. We've got a lot of things to talk about. To give you a sense of to the rhythm uh, for this hour together, we're going to try to spend the first hour kind of level setting the situation. What are the factors bearing on the problem? And then for the last half, we'd like to get into a discussion as to, so what does that mean for you? What are the steps that you need to be taking? What are the things you need to be looking at? What are your indicators and warnings with regard to the situation in Northeast Asia? So, Skip and Victor, great to be with you again. Uh, happy to talk about these things with folks who actually know what they're talking about. So, about two years ago, when, before we got to administration change and so on, I began to set the North Korean problem along these lines. Within our current definition of acceptable risk, before the end of the administration of the next president, whoever he or she might be, we would probably be faced with the North Korea able to reach North America with an indigenously produced ICBM, with an indigenously produced nuclear weapon. And the core there was within our current definition of acceptable risk. And so I think the Trump administration approach, quite, quite logically, is we're going to change our definition of acceptable risk. So I guess I'd ask two questions. Uh, number one, what kind of tools do we have available to do this that make a difference? And number two, the target of these actions, and I'll assume for the moment it's Kim Jong-un, although it could be the Chinese, the target of these actions, is he rational or not? Does he calibrate things carefully? or is he purely uh, instinctive? So, so, so let's begin with, if we want to change our definition of acceptable risk, what are the tools? Skip? Um, I think a couple of things. Uh, first off, the ability to have, speaking from a military perspective, the right capabilities uh, in theater, and that's our capabilities, it's South Korean capabilities, and quite frankly, it's uh, Chinese or Japanese capabilities also, to hopefully deter North Korea from acting kinetically against South Korea or Japan or the United but States. That, but that's acting, all right? And, and very often the administration language confuses me because some of the language, particularly from the president, seems to be that we're going to take action simply because he possesses a capability, not yeah. just that he uses but, it. But what I'm saying is we need to get that set because I think having that capability to deter either a first or a second strike or set, you know, attack capability from North Korea is a basis that we have to have in place. Okay. And I think a lot of that is happening. It has happened over the last several years. I think there's more. And that's that, within that reach. I mean, we have the military power have, to do that. We, South Korea and Japan, have the military capability to be able to yeah. do that. Um, I think some of the other tools, though, that could be used, I, I, the sanctions, I think, are, are good. Uh, I think that they are um, they're necessary. I don't think they're sufficient in order to be able to change the North Korea calculus uh, to the point where they would give up their nuclear weapons. Uh, I do think that, uh, that we ought to look more at the, I'll call it the informational arm mm. of power, okay. to be able to see is there a way that we can start getting some internal pressure coming from inside of North Korea to try to force Kim Jong-un to change. Um, I think there's many steps that have to get to do that. You have to look at it from the eyes of the North Korean people. What would a change North Korea and how would that benefit North Korean people and Chinese people to, again, try to get some force of some change? It, it, it would not be a quick process. Uh, it is a difficult process. But I personally think no matter how much external pressure you have, Kim Jong-un is not going to give up his nuclear yeah. weapons. And the only hope to be able to get this to the point of a nuclear weapon-free peninsula, I think, is a combination of some external and internal pressure. Okay, so, so to reset what I think you just told us is, number one, we should use our combat power to hold, to, to prevent him from doing some things that throws us completely off the rails. You're okay with diplomatic isolation. You're okay with economic sanctions, but you're convinced they will not be sufficient 
to get him to change course with regard to his nuclear weapons. And it's intriguing what you just suggested because the informational arm means, I think, correct me if I've got it wrong, I think the informational arm means you're suggesting we use that capacity to undermine his legitimacy, yes. stability, and so on, and that gets his attention? It undermine, it, I think it would definitely get his attention, <laughs> uh, and I think it's, it's either to undermine it or you could take the optimistic view to hopefully cause him to say, okay, I need to change. I, I got to back I, I away. Need, I got to, yeah. And the only, other, the only other tweak of what you just said uh, in the summarizing of what I said is, is I think the combat capability is not just to deter him from first strike capabilities. I see that we may end up having a time where we decide either to shoot a missile down before or after he launches. So on the pad or, or in at, flight. Or in flight. And we need to have the capabilities in place that he says, okay, even if the U.S. does this, I better I... not strike out because look at the capabilities that the Alliance has okay. that could be their second strike, okay. if you will. I, I want to come back to you and that later with that sweet spot, something dramatic enough to really get his or the Chinese attention, but not so dramatic that he really does have to pull the trigger to come back. But, but Victor, let me ask, ask you the same question I asked Skip. You know, what are the tools? How are we playing them? What are the prospects for success? So um, I think Skip really covered all the tools. I mean, on the one hand, there is there are the military tools, which include everything from looking at uh, 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 preemptive or preventive action to uh, deterrence. Um, and, uh, and I think this administration has been, from day one, studying all of these very carefully, looking at old plans, looking for new plans, asking militaries to be creative. I think they're looking for all sorts of different ways um, to look at different angles on, on the problem. The biggest piece that we've seen visibly uh, of the toolkit has been the sanctions piece. Uh, and there, while um, the thing we have to remember about sanctions, um, uh, Mike, is that uh, the, they don't work until they do, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you can say that almost historically, almost every sanctions yeah, yeah. campaign. My metaphor is skip stuff, my stuff, those are explosions, yours rust. They're the same, they're the same physical event, right. but it just takes longer. That's right. And by the way, when something rusts through, yeah. it's destroyed. It's destroyed, right, exactly. And, um, and so in that sense, I feel like although the, the sort of change that we're looking for has not come yet, uh, at the same time, if a year ago I had said to you that, if I had said to you a year ago that, you know, the Chinese are going to stop importing coal, um, they're going to cut one-third of their oil, they're going to stop importing seafood, which is probably the biggest business between the two militaries, the KPA and okay. the, uh, the Chinese um, uh, PLA, uh, and that they were going to also do uh, sectoral measures that have no um, military bearing whatsoever, like textiles, which is currently the North Korean economy's biggest hard currency generator. If I had said a year ago that's where we'd be today, most people would not have believed us. So I think in that sense we've seen progress over time, but again, sanctions don't work until they do. They w people will say that san these sanctions are not going to work until the day that they happen to bring North Korea back to the table. So, so by, by the way, that, that's your off-ramp, right? North Korea back to the table? Well, that's, well, that's the third piece. The third piece is that, um, you know, you can't have the military, you need the military element, and it's very important. And then you have the sanctions piece, but you've got to have an off-ramp somewhere. Otherwise, you're just pushing, you know, somebody into a corner. And so uh, the off-ramp, as we've heard Secretary Tillerson say over the past couple of weeks, has really been the, trying to get some sort of diplomacy back on track. So. In that sense, the sanctions are there to set up some sort of negotiation. We really don't have a sense of what that negotiation right. looks like right now, and I'm, I'm not sure what the strategy is for a negotiation. And there, there may not be that detail in the plan yet. Right, yeah. exactly. You know, there might not be. Um, and um, uh, so I think so. Th those are sort of the three bigger elements. Um, as you uh, suggested in your question, one of the biggest targets of all this is North Korea, but the other big target is China. Uh, they're particularly on the sanctions piece from April in Mar-a-Lago. You know, President Trump is trying to push the Chinese to do more on the sanctions piece. If you talk to anybody in this administration, there's one figure that they all recite to you, and that is that 90 percent of North Korea's external trade today is with one country, and that is China. And so uh, there's been this very concentrated effort on trying to get China to do more. 
Again, I think it's, it's been much maligned, but at the same time, I feel like, again, a year ago, if I had said to you China's going to be doing all these things, most people would have said, no, I don't believe it. It seems to be having an impact. Um, there was NGO reporting last week that after the announcement of the oil sanctions, which, by the way, was the first time there's been a UN Security Council resolution on North Korea that specifically targets oil. This was the first one after the six test. NGO reporting is that gas prices in North Korea are up three times uh, year on year. That could be hoarding, that could be actual shortages, but the point is they appear to be having some sort of impact. So I'm going to ask you in a minute, Skip, about your view of the Chinese and you know, would they, could they, can they? All right. Uh, but, but, but before we leave, uh, Victor, uh, Kim Jong Un. All right. Now, I, I, frankly, I, I do believe all this is designed to influence more the Chinese mm -hmm. than it is Kim, who seems mm -hmm. to be set in his ways. And I haven't met any members of the Kim dynasty, but I've served in Korea when when his father was there, and his father seemed to be more willing to be a dealer. I mean, uh, someone you could actually sit with and perhaps offer incentives for him to change behavior. Is Kim the youngest in that group? It doesn't appear to be. At least right now, it doesn't appear to be. Um, so we have, we've actually have looked at the data on this. And um, uh, under the current leadership, uh, there has not been a single high-level state, head of state interaction with any other country. In He's never world. left the country. Never left the country. Never met with a single leader um, uh, outside, of, uh, outside of North Korea. We have an entire data set on China, DPRK, high-level interactions. Um, and uh, obviously we're at a historic low now in terms of North Korea, China interactions. But what we also found was that this is not because the Chinese are pissed off at the North Koreans. The Chinese actually have been trying very hard to talk to the North Koreans. And the North Koreans have been denying all interaction, all interaction. So um, there is a great deal of concern that this leadership, unlike his father, as, as you just mentioned, doesn't seem to want to be in touch with the outside world, um, um, clearly is not responding to any entreaties, whether it's coming from the Russians or the Chinese or the South Koreans, for that matter, or, or others. Um, and for all of our military tools to work, particularly in terms of deterrence, you know, that requires rational signaling that is received <laughs> rationally. And it's just not clear if this leader um, is receiving these signals in a way that we would expect the target of any sort of deterrent signals to, refi to receive them. So uh, let, me, let me take what you said, play it back, and then, okay, so he's obsessive about getting yeah. to this place. I, I, yeah. I don't think he's crazy. I think he's, he's coldly, calculatingly rational within his framework, but you have to exist within his framework. And I think all of us have negotiated with North Koreans, and you understand they bring their own mm -hmm. world to the negotiating table, and, and, it's, and it's not our, our yeah. world. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I think that that's right. And they are very good at leveraging the peaceful status quo yeah. because they know that we value it, the world values it more than they do. Um, and that's why they've always been able to take a weak hand and play it uh, and, and play it quite well. I mean, I, I, I do, you know, I, I think you're right. I think Kim Jong il, his father, and his grandfather, Kim Il sung. You know, they were much more in touch with the outside world. <coughs> I think they understood um, much better what the limits were in terms of how far you could go in provoking uh, the United States, South Korea, or Japan. It's just not clear to me with this yeah. fellow. So. Skip, I know you have some comments on what's been said already, and I also want you to take a look at uh, the Chinese. Can they? Is it a question of will or capacity? How far can they go even if they really wanted to? So I think that one of the reasons, probably the main reason that Kim Jong-un, I agree with you completely, Victor, has not willing to, to talk and has shunned off all, all attempts to make that happen is he truly wants to get to the point where he has a nuclear capability that can be delivered anywhere in the world that's believed and real, not only from his perspective, but from the rest of the world, to put him into a better bargaining position when he walks in. And I think even when he walks in, that's not, that will, to, to take that and put that on the table, he might say, I can freeze it, you can have all kinds of controls and all, if the U.S. leaves, if you agree to all of these other things. But I don't think that, uh, that even when he gets to that point, 
that he'll be willing, if we get to talks, that he'll be willing to give up his nuclear capability. Um, I think he could actually use that as an offensive capability or threatening capabilities uh, when he gets to that point. To your question on the, the Chinese, I think the Chinese, um, I have been, I agree with Victor, I would have lost the many six packs of beer if I'd been it a year ago that we are to where we are today. Um, uh, I think that they can severely hurt North Korea uh, as far as if you look at it from a military perspective, they cut off all the oil, um, you know, they're not going to have what little bit of fuel they do have to run their tanks and all of that. They would have even less or to fly their aircraft would have even less. They're cutting off all of that would definitely hurt if we ever went to war, obviously, because you, were, you acquire capabilities, you acquire fuel in order to be able to go to war and food and other things also. Um, I think that they, North Korea, has enough, I'll call it indigenous capabilities to survive both food-wise, to some degrees economically-wise, um, and just from their internal what they have in order to be able to continue developing a nuclear and a ballistic missile capability. Uh, I think that can be generated internally for a fairly long period of time. So I'm not advocating China stop, yeah. or, but I do think that... But it's rust, it's not... It, yeah. It's, yeah, that's a very good analogy. Okay. Um, yeah. So you were commander not too many years ago. Uh, the trend lines have been predictable for the last 20 years on the peninsula in terms of combat power. Could you just lay out for, for our viewers the, the relative military balance in all of its dimensions on the peninsula, north, south, U.S.? Okay, um, just briefly, uh, let's start with, with uh, the alliance, the, the Republic of Korea U.S. alliance. Uh, we have 28,500 service members that serve on the peninsula on a daily basis. The majority of those are Army. Uh, the next biggest is Air Force and then a small contingent of Navy and Marines. It is a combined command, and it truly is, meaning that South Koreans and the U.S. service members that are there serve side by side, they train together, they plan together. There's a combined headquarters that if we had to go to war, that headquarters would be the headquarters that uh, currently Vince Brooks, a uh, U.S. commander, would be the commander of combined, it's called Combined Forces Command. Um, the U.S. could bring in fairly quickly uh, the forces that we have in Japan and some strategic forces from the United States. So a large naval force, a large air forces that are currently stationed in Japan and in the Pacific could be brought in fairly quickly from a U.S. perspective in order to be able to deter or respond if there was an attack. Um, the South Korean military is an outstanding military, a very large military. Uh, they are the forces that are on the border right now between North and South Korea. They're there 24 hours a day with some very strong capabilities. It is the most fortified border <laughs> anywhere in the world on both sides of that. Uh, all kinds of artillery pieces facing each other um, along the border up, up there. Uh, the South Korean military is professional. They're trained. Uh, they have an outstanding uh, equipment uh, from their ground forces to the air. Uh, their naval forces are really are a very, very good military. What North Korea brings, if you get beyond the ballistic missile right. and the nuclear capability, is a force that is very large. Uh, as you've read over the weekend, four million more volunteer to go <laughs> into the military. Not sure what that really means, but because uh, they already have a very, very large military. Um, they bring a lot of capability as far as just numbers. And that's numbers not only in people, but also in artillery capability. That's all located, that ma great majority of it's located uh, very close to the border. Some of their long range capability, a large part of it could actually range Seoul, a city of uh, a metropolitan your, area your, your of, headquarters. of 20 million people, yeah. or probably even larger than that right now. Um, so they bring that capability, that's, that's really the biggest threat they have. The other capabilities that North Korea has that we cannot forget beyond that, that immediate just numbers and artillery capability is their special operating yeah. forces that spend a lot of time uh, investing in those capabilities to be able to get those quickly into South Korea to do terrorist types of operations and, and operations in South Korea dis to disrupt. And then the other one is the cyber. Um, cannot forget their cyber, North Korea's cyber capability. We saw what they did to Sony. Uh, there's been other indications that they are aggressively looking at uh, ways and having the ability 
to be able to disrupt not only command and control systems within the military, but civilian systems also. And so those are, those are you know, kind of a rundown on capabilities that are, that are, that are there. And there's no question if we went to a war, if we went to an all-out war and either South Korea, I mean North Korea attacked and we went to our war plans, that, that, that we, South Korea and the United States, would, would win in that conflict. There'd be lots of people, lots of destruction, lots of people killed and lots of destruction that would happen though. We don't normally think of nuclear weapons as asymmetrical capability, but, but, but is there some truth that the eroding conventional balance south to north it might be motivating the, the, the North Koreans to invest in these weapons? I, I, maybe marginally, I think the reason that he's investing in, that, in those weapons is that he's looked at the past and he is, believes truly that as long as he has nuclear capability, nobody will do an attack in North Korea so, to take his So here the lesson off. is uh, Iraq, Libya, even Ukraine that gave up weapons in, term, in return for territorial guarantees. Yeah. So I think, he, I think he's doing it for that reason. I, I also think that it goes beyond that, though. I think that once he has the capability, he'll use it as a threatening capability. So not, not just to prevent an attack, but use it but to coerce? To, to coerce, exactly, yeah. Either through, you know, going to a case at San Francisco or Seoul, he'll try to split the alliance. Uh, he will, it will enable him to do potentially some non-nuclear, kinetic attacks where, in the, where if he didn't have it, then he would say, okay, South Korea will come north. Well, yep, but now yep. they're not going to come north because yep. I have still I have the nuclear threat okay. that's out there. Victor, Skip lays out a lot of allied combat power. It's actually getting stronger rather than weaker. Right. Um, you've got the South Koreans uh, not disarming in any way, shape, or form. You've got the American presence there re-legitimized and, and, and somewhat expanding. You've got the Japanese rearming. From the Chinese point of view, this is a tremendous strategic inconsistency. This is not where they want the region to be going. Right. Why right. doesn't that in motivate them to do a bit more? Right, that's right. a very good question, and you would think that there are, and I think there are, many in China who are looking at the situation exactly like you're looking at it, and they see essentially a declining asset in North Korea to the, to the extent that they even considered it an asset. Um, and the response to that declining asset being um, a change in the overall strategic situation that, that does not bode well for China's long-term interests. I mean, this, this um, is just cutting across the, what it is they want to have happen. Right, right. And so, so that to me is sometimes puzzling, but at the same time, I look at China's overall strategy towards the Korean Peninsula today, China, which is supposed to be, they are, China's supposed to be the long-term strategic thinker. Patient, right? patient, strategic, right? historic. Right, they think a thousand years ahead, we can't even think about next week, you know, that sort of thing. And you look at their situation today, and they have the worst possible relationship with both North Korea and South Korea. South Korea won of their own making. Of their own making, because of the way they responded to the deployment of a THAAD battery on the Korean Peninsula. And in the case of North Korea, as I said earlier, they have no real ability to make inroads to the leadership. Uh, every time the North Koreans do a test, uh, the Chinese get blamed for it by the international community. So um, sometimes I, I am of the view that um, China just does not know what to do right now on the Korean Peninsula. I mean, people may not like our policy, but at least we're trying something, right? The Chinese seem to have no idea what to do at this particular situation. They've ruined their relationship with South Korea. And I think it is, this is not, this is not um, temporary. I think the, the sort of econ sustained economic pressure they have put on South Korean companies because of the THAAD deployment I think has fundamentally changed the way South Koreans think about China today. Um, and in the case of North Korea, I mean, this is just a problem run amok that they cannot, they cannot seem to, to, get, to get control of. Can I just say something on, 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 on um, uh, North Korea and your question about asymmetry? I mean, I, I entirely agree with, with Skip that the, their, the purpose of driving for these programs is not simply for defensive purposes. 
I mean, I understand the argument, you know, paranoid dictator, no friends around him, he feels he needs the ultimate weapon. And in fact, when we used to do negotiations with them over the six party talks back in 2007, there were moments where they would get angry and off script they would say, you know, we need these weapons because you invaded Afghanistan and they didn't have nuclear weapons. You invaded Iraq, they didn't have nuclear uh, uh, weapons. You will never invade Iran and you will never invade us. And that was just a very telling right, uh, motivation behind why they were pursuing these weapons. But I agree with Skip that that is not, regimes like this are not status quo oriented. Right? They are predatory. So in the end, once they perfect or acquire this capability, they re really want to try to break the alliance. They want to try to break by threatening the uh, U.S. cities and Japanese cities. They want to try to decouple Korean security from Japanese and U.S. commitments. And I think you know, that is part of the reason they're flying these projectiles over the Japanese archipelago and, and in the direction, you know, of threatening Guam and Hawaii and, and the mainland U.S. So to you, yeah, to, to, uh, to your point on, on China, um, so why can't we work through, and maybe we are, a strategy that goes to China? The U.S. goes to China and says along the lines, okay, let's take care of this North Korean problem. And, and what you will end up with is a peninsula that is more in line with your vital national interests than the concerns that you have right now. Right. And if, we can talk about where what U.S. troops are. And how yeah. many and we where. can talk where U.S. troops yeah. are. We can talk about. We know you've done a lot of investment, China, into some infrastructure in northern North Korea. We know you'd like to have some mineral and some port rights. We know that you don't want to have to pay for refugees. Work through a strategy that gets them more to the point where there is a strategy mm -hmm. that U.S. and China is working yeah. together on to be able okay. to do that. Great. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question because I worked in the same building. Were from where you commanded, called the White House in Yongsan Garrison. Uh, and we, it's a combined command. We're working with the Koreans. Okay, your deputy was always a Korean, and actually a very powerful Korean, both with the Americans and back into the ROC Army. Yeah. You know, a lot of what we have done in the last five or six months, amping this up, and our darker moments, has looked as if we were yelling at the North Koreans over the heads of our South Korean friends. So General Kim is the deputy commander of CFC. What kind of conversations are going on between him and General Brooks? What's General Brooks trying to explain to him? Yeah, so for your audience, uh, General Brooks, Vince Brooks is the commander. He wears three hats in Korea. It's the U.S. Forces Korea commander, the Combined Forces commander, and also the United Nations commander. General Kim is his Korean deputy in the Combined Forces Command um, uh, command. Their offices are side by side within the White House, the headquarters. We have ROC and U.S. officers at all ranks in all departments serving side by side. So it truly okay. is a combined, combined headquarters. And I think what you know, Vince and General Kim discuss probably on a daily, if not an even more often <laughs> than that basis, is, is, okay, how are we moving forward? What is the strategy? And it's, and it's two ways. It is, yes, I'm sure Vince is saying, okay, here's what we're pushing from a U.S. perspective. Here's things that we're thinking about doing. Here's things that we are doing. Um, and then it's also, because remember, as I said earlier, it's Korean forces that are on the border. And those forces are commanded on a day-to-day -day basis, not by General Brooks, but right. by the ROC Minister of Defense and the ROC Chairman of their Joint Chiefs of Staff. And so the feed is, is coming into General Brooks from that side through, in many cases, his rock deputy that says, okay, here's what we're seeing on the border. Here's yeah. what the Blue House, the Korean um, White House, is thinking as far as, uh, as where we ought to be going and coordinating those messages yeah. as it okay. goes forward. It, it is a very strong command uh, that has a lot of internal mechanisms, both formal and informal, to make sure that both sides, from a military perspective, um, and, and I, I think, think also, also from, from a diplomatic perspective, I've served nowhere else in the world where the military arm and the embassy arm yeah. uh, are closer <laughs> together than in the Republic of Korea. Uh, they, they really, really are. And I've uh, been there as chief of staff, and the, the mm -hmm. amount of time you spend back and forth okay. downtown. Yeah, Victor, one final question before we move on to sure. some things our, our friends might be thinking about. Is it possible, in your point of view, to get an Iran-type 
thing out of negotiations with the North Korean? And I, I said thing because obviously the circumstances are, are quite different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the circumstances are quite different. Um, uh, in the case of North Korea, we're talking about um, weapons that actually exist, right. or is right. in the Iran case, it was always about potential. Um, uh, I think there are certainly similarities in terms of the sanctions path that we're pursuing between the Iran and North Korea cases. Arguably, um, the path that the current administration is on with regard to sanctions is not that dissimilar from where the Obama administration was probably in the last six months of their term in office when they, I think, made the decision to switch from so-called strategic patience to a much more aggressive sanctions policy. There's been obviously much more since Trump, but I think there's continuity there. Um, there are a couple of problems, I think, with the Iran, Iran type deal for North Korea. Um, and one of them, I think your viewers will be aware, well aware of. The second one, maybe not so much. The first is um, that Iran is not North Korea. I mean, these are two very different cases. Um, uh, politically, you know, one could argue that the North Korea case might require even more political capital to be spent to try to get support for a deal like that was already spent to get the Iran type deal. Political capital domestically here? Domestically um, in, 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 in the, in, here in, in Washington, D.C. I think that's certainly part of it. But the other part of it is something you know, that um, I'm afraid that comes from my experience in negotiating the last agreement with North Korea, right. the 2005-2007 agreements. I've looked at the Iran deal. I mean, I've looked at the documents of, what, 150 pages, several hundred pages of annexes. Um, having negotiated the last agreement with North Korea, I don't think they're capable. The North Koreans. The North Koreans of negotiating that type of an agreement. Complexity. Complexity, detail. I mean, it requires, I think they have technical experts, sure. But what it requires is a level of technical expertise but also at a very high political level, yeah. right? So we had we actually had the energy secretary right. negotiating pieces of this deal um, under the Obama administration, and I just it's hard for me to imagine that the North Koreans could even do something like that. And if we were even at that point, and the North Koreans were incapable of doing that, and they needed someone to negotiate for them, there's nobody that they could trust to negotiate on their behalf. So. Um, you know, even in, so this is when I get the most depressed, is because you think, all right, the sanctions are to set up a negotiation, they're not to go to war, but then even if we get at the table, you know, are they even capable, capable of doing something getting like that? Getting a deal of this, really, the Iran deal, for better or for worse, and we all, I think, had issues with the Iran deal, right. well, was a masterpiece of subtlety, occasional dual meaning, yes. Uh, yes. winked understandings, yes. and that just doesn't work with with these folks. Yeah, I think that's right. And and I, you know, so I, yes, and I'm, you know, Mike, I've read the things you've written on the deal, and I, I, I think a lot of the points that you make are completely valid about the deal. But just, you know, the, the nuances, the level of complexity, the direct negotiation by technical experts who have a high level of political uh, power in their system, I just don't see it on their side. And that, that makes it very difficult to imagine. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's downshift here. Let me quickly summarize. All right, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. It's not gonna go away soon. None of us are yet predicting imminent catastrophe, but it could get a bit worse in, in all of our eyes, I think, all right? So now, what do we, what do we tell our friends, business interest, uh, people interested in investing, people who have presence there already, people who fly in and out of the area? What is it they should be doing now? What are the kinds of precautions they should be taking? And then maybe the next round, what are the INW, the indication and warning indicators that would cause them to amp it up? Now, I suspect, as commander, you went down and talked to the Chamber of Commerce occasionally, because I know I did as Deputy Chief of Staff. So let me let you start. So I think there's a, there's a couple things that companies should be, and I hope in most cases are doing. Um, I think the first thing comes is just accountability of people. Do you know where your people are that are in theater? Are you are in the country? Are you able to quickly reach them? Uh, a strong accountability of people. Um, I'd say the next one is again, if people have um, 
facilities that are that are there in Korea. And again, these are all kind of contingency plannings in case things really elevate, escalate very quickly. Is our first responders prepared? Do you have preparations in order to be able to deal with, you know, a, a very rapidly escalating and potentially deadly uh, attack from North Korea of any type? Uh, I think a very strong relationship with the State Department, with the embassy, to understand the non-combatant evacuation operation plan. What, it, what would happen if you had to be able to do that, to be able to, to get uh, your workers that are, that are there out of there? Um, I think those are all important as you go through. I think if you take a look at um, from a cyber perspective, are you well protected in Korea or are you vulnerable in Korea because of North Korean cyber capabilities, I think is, is worth doing. Um, and basically, as you, and we'll, I know we'll get to the indicators and warnings okay. here in a minute, but as you see these indicators and warnings starting to be checked off, do you have a process in place that kind of ramps up your preparedness and what you are doing now and what you are thinking about doing in the future based upon that. Yeah. I think those are some of the, that plan and having exercised that plan and understanding not only at the very senior level but within your organization, what do you do if you see this start escalating uh, would not only save lives but potentially um, really help a company in a yeah. situation along these lines. Victor, we, we speculated earlier you may or may not become ambassador, but we don't have an ambassador. Mark Lippert left on inauguration day, so now we're eight months uh, without an ambassador. A, a couple of things. Uh, number one, does that matter for what we're talking about here? And secondly, whomever becomes ambassador becomes now responsible for US, not just US mission, but all uh, US persons in the Republic. Uh, what has to, a new ambassador, be, what does he or she have to begin thinking about? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, it, it has been a long time um, uh, where there hasn't been a new ambassador in Seoul. I think the team there now is very good. The acting um, uh, person is Mark Knapper, the yeah. DCM, who is a very experienced uh, State Department professional, very experienced in the region, very experienced in Korea. Um, it's well networked in Korea. Probably many of your uh, viewers who have, um, who have um, business in Korea probably already know him. Um, so I'm, I'm not worried. I'm not worried in that respect. Um, uh, having said that, it is, I, I do feel like it is, it, we are in a different time uh, now. Uh, both of you have served at very high levels in Korea, and so you, you and both of you have experienced times of tension, uh, very, times of very high tension in, in the relationship. Um, uh, businesses in Korea, businesses who have been in Korea have always been I won't say been optimistic, but they have developed a very high threshold mm. for not just uh, Korean businesses. Not just Korean businesses. No, um, um, all, all sorts of businesses, um, both uh, Korean and non-Korean, have a very high developed a very high threshold for uh, North Korean behavior. In my experience, they have a lower threshold for dramatic or, or subtle, but distinct changes in U.S. behavior. So I think in many ways companies, investors, when we enter a spiral of a crisis with North Korea, in many cases I think they focus less on North Korean action than they focus more on U.S. response. Uh, uh, you, you know, if, if in certain circumstances we normally don't respond and then we do respond this time, then people's sort of so, warning lights go on. So, so let, me, let me toss responses out, all yeah, right? Yeah. Um, Let's, let's start low threshold. Stopping the flow of military dependence. Not, not a neo, not an evacuation, not grab your go bag, but you just decide that we're, we're going to pause in the flow of military dependence. I, by the way, I'm not suggesting we know that's policy, that that's being considered, but I'm, I'm just looking for the kinds of things that U.S. response, and, and, and Skip, I'll, I'll come to you in a minute, but despite all of our chest thumping, we really haven't changed our force posture much on, on the peninsula or... We, we have, I can't get into some of the classified yeah, yeah, things, sure. but, but we have, I'll put it this way, we have, if you look at what would be needed to go to war from a both logistics capability and a force capability, um, 
we have made some some improvements along some lines that were absolutely needed over there and done that over the last year. So I, I suspect you're talking about quiet logistics and yes. infrastructure. Yes, yeah. yes, and we also, I think, have worked to, uh, I'll call it refine our plans, um, keep them, make sure they're up to date. We have done some very strong exercises that are focused exercises based upon some potential contingencies. From a military perspective, we have also, we, we and the South Koreans have also started to work much more closely with the Japanese Self-Defense Force. There have been some military, that's getting started along those mm -hmm. lines. Um, so if you look at those capabilities, we, we have done okay. some changes right. there. But, but Victor, back to the earlier question about, you know, you've got, what, 180,000 Americans? There's more than that. More than that? Yeah. More, yeah. 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 In, in the Republic? Yeah. Um, Number one, what's the embassy messaging to them now, and what are the steps that, that, that the embassy might use as this perhaps gets more difficult? Well, I think the, so for example, the, Mike, the, the, the very specific um, example that you just gave of sort of stopping military dependence yeah. from rotating, uh, moving into grid, just stopping that. See, it's, I mean, it's just one person's opinion, but from what I've seen um, dealing with companies and investors that look in Korea, it's um, who, they may not have a lot of um, insight into the quiet logistics things and things that right. uh, Skip was mentioning. But if a move like that leaked yeah, in the press, I think it would go up. I mean, I'm reminded of um, 1994, mm -hmm. summer 1994, um, when um, it leaked to the press that uh, the embassy was, it wasn't an order, but recommended, this was June of 94, so the context was the North Koreans were told by the United States not to defuel the five megawatt reactor. So there were spent fuel rods in the reactor. If they defueled the reactor, that would have been the first step to extracting weapons-grade plutonium for nuclear bombs. And the United States said very clearly to the North Koreans, do not defuel the reactor, and they defueled it. Um, and at that point, the Clinton administration was looking and thinking about strike plans. It's been written about um, by a number of authors. Um, and it leaked at the time, I remember, that um, embassy uh, dependents were not required, but were given, were suggested to take early summer vacation, early leave, summer leave, I think was the way they put it. And that leaked in the press. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. Maybe you were even there when this happened. And the shelves were empty. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could not find bread. You could not find anything on the shelves. So not, not, not in the base commissary. You're talking about within it, the republic. No, I'm talking about in the, in the, this was the, yeah. you know, this is the South Korean public, which normally has a very high threshold uh, level of tolerance for sure. North Korean behavior. So, so with that in mind. Yeah, and, the, and if you want to give a strong signal to North Korea, oh we're not ready to yeah. really go to yeah. war. So, so, <laughs> so I, I guess that's what I'm trying to drive to. And so we're not going to get that because there are other people going to read those in ways that are not going to be helpful, the North Koreans as one. And so what should these folks be looking for? What are the indicators that, that might actually happen and be visible? So um, I think you have to, if you're looking at indicators, look at it not only from the perspective of, of North Korea, and I'll go over a couple of those, but also kind of regional wide. So what is, what is China doing? What is South Korea doing? What is the U.S. doing? But if you look at it from a, from a, a, a North Korean perspective, and I think what you're really getting at is what are some of the indicators that things are starting to ramp up that North Korea may believe they need to either strike out to coalesce their people back together or react to something right. that the U.S. and then you can get into a rapidly escalating scenario that takes you to war and takes you to death in, in South Korea. So if you take a look at it first off from a North Korean perspective, I take a lot of look at, okay, what sorts of, you, you do got to look at what Kim Jong-un says. Yes, he has you know, <laughs> rhetoric, he says it in strange, some, some strange ways. But he generally ends up doing, in many cases, what he says he's going to do. So you've got to, you've got to I think, look at what he is, he is saying and, and, and obviously what, what he is doing. I think, are there emergency meetings being called within North Korea? Uh, there's several very good 
unclassified open source you know, uh, capabilities out there with NK Pro and, and, and other folks like that that take a look at where, you know, I read over the weekend in one of the newspapers, you know, he's moving missiles types of things. So you can kind of get a sense, is North Korean, from a military perspective, ramping up some? I think that's good to watch. I think a key indicator to watch, and this one is a little bit more difficult to see in an unclassified mode, is do you, is there any instability that's happening in, the North. in North Korea? Because I think if you start seeing some signs of instability, and that gets out through you know the different sources we talked about, Kim Jong Un will most likely then say, "Okay, I've got to coalesce my people back together." And I know how to do that. And I know how to do that. I strike, and then yeah. blame it on on South Korea and the United States. And since 2010, the response to that coming back from South Korea will be very strong and very, very yeah. different than it is then. In, in the past. It, yeah. Than it was in the past. Uh, so that's kind of from a North Korea perspective. I think from a Chinese perspective, uh, this is kind of, it goes back and forth because in one sense, I think China's doing things that, starting to do things right now that might really worry you. Okay, this Kim Jong-un could really say, I'm being backed in the corner, I need to do something. So cutting off things, the sanctions there. The, the not having you know, any sorts of relationships with, with North Korea, the more vocal that China gets that, okay, things between, I'm not gonna, you know, when, when Xi Jinping came out and said that if North Korea strikes first, I'm not there for you type of thing. Right. I think some of those indicators, where's China pushing? The same sorts of things happen with, on the Japan side. How much are they willing to say, okay, if I get a missile that flies over next time, I'm going to shoot it down. Or if I'm more worried that it's going to hit, I'm going to shoot beforehand type of thing. From a U.S. and a South Korean perspective, I've already talked about some of them. I mean, if we ever get to the point where the State Department puts out a travel advisory on South Korea, that's a, oh, what's going on here type of thing. If we ever get to the first part of a NEO evacuation, which is a voluntary evacuation, you know, before you get to right. ordered right. evacuation, that becomes obviously a very high signal. I think your, what you laid out earlier, if we stop sending dependents over there, that's, that's a signal that, uh, that is there. So I think there's things that, that companies can watch. Um, it, it's, the things companies have to remember though is this thing could escalate very, very quickly. And you gotta have plans in place that account for that quick escalation. So Victor, this is really clouded in hyperbole. Mm. From now, from both governments, our own and the and the North Korean, um, and so journalism, all right, or, or reporting, or uh, thought pieces, or think tanks around town become, I think, very important. Um, what are good sources? Who do you read? I mean, seriously. I mean, uh, in ter in terms of journalists who cover this well, uh, who should they be paying more attention to? Because I, I get the CIA press clips every morning, right. and I can tell what paper it is by the tone of the headline, yeah. and some of them I just dismiss as, that's not worth my time reading. Yeah. Yeah. Who's yeah. worth your time reading? Yeah. So it's a great question. You know, I, I think, um, um, so, the, um, so the folks that are there, um, uh, to me, are going to be a lot better than the folks who are here in Washington writing about okay. this. Um, so, uh, you know, all the, whether it's the Wall Street Journal or the Post, uh, who have people, like the Journal has people who are in Korea all the time, the Wall Street Journal, and, and you know, they cover other issues, but they are also covering the security situation. I think they're pretty good. Um, I think the Post is pretty good too, but, um, but as Skip mentioned earlier, some of these um, uh, specialized webs, uh, websites and um, uh, NGOs that are focused on North Korea, I think, um, offer some pretty good information. And what I read kind, them what kind of? So you mentioned NK, NK, uh, 38, Pro, North, NK 38 Pro, North, 38 North, yeah. NK News. Um, these are all fairly good websites. Um, they, many of them uh, have folks who operate on the border. North Korea is a lot more porous than it used, than it used to be. And so things like prices, the price of gas, these sorts of things, I think they're all important indicators of whether you know the pressure and the pressure cooking cooker is getting is getting higher and higher. Um, um, you know, I, so, but I think that the, I should also say that while I think it's important for companies and others to be ready and be prepared, as, as Skip as Skip mentioned, we also have to remember that as 
uh, as tense as the situation may feel today, um, this is a place where deterrence is held mm -hmm. for well over five, six decades. And we have had, as you gentlemen will remember, we have had periods of very high tension mm -hmm. on the Korean Peninsula yeah. where North Korea has not threatened to shoot down U.S. planes, but actually has shot down a U.S. plane in which all the crewmen were killed. Um, they've held crewmen, of, they've seized naval vessels. There are things that the North Koreans have done in the past um, that were basically acts of war. Um, and yet, stability and deterrence uh, has, has held on the peninsula. And I think that's something that's very, um, that, that's very important to remember. Um, the, in addition, and this goes a few iterations back in what we were discussing, what I find interesting about North Korean behavior today under Kim Jong-un is that the level of nastiness against the South is actually quite low. Hmm. Right? And that is, I think, because part of the strategy now with, WM, with ICBMs and with hydrogen bombs that can reach the United States is, you know, they want to decouple South Korean security from Japan and the United States. This is not a good objective from the perspective of the alliance, but I think what it means is that that actually means there's going to be less action taken against South Korea and more of these actions taken against Japan or the, or, or, or the United States. In addition, you have a progressive government in right. South Korea, one that is desirous of engaging with North Korea if the, you know, if the overall political environment is right. The last time the North Koreans carried out a conventional provocation against the South was in 2010, right? The sinking of the naval vessel. Well, yeah. the, no, and the artillery. And the artillery, artillery, and the artillery sharing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, but both of those things were against a government that the, in South Korea that the North Koreans detested. I mean, it was a conservative government that they really, really disliked. And so I'm not saying that the North Koreans are protecting the South Koreans, but they seem to be very focused on us. Right. Yeah, I, and I, I agree with that. I do think, just to add on to that point, that, that since November of 2010, when the artillery attack happened, South Korea overnight changed that if North Korea does this again, the response coming right. back in is going to be very rapid and very, very strong. I mean, ministers have been fired because they didn't yeah. do that quickly. I've used the words not proportional and not local. Right. right. And, yeah. uh, and I think that has a deterrent value. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Uh, that, that, uh, that Kim Jong-un realizes that anything along those lines um, could bring back something that could be really hurt him, but then also could escalate to some place that he's not prepared quite yet to go yet because he doesn't truly have potentially the nuclear capability right, not, to hit, right. to change, you know, to Tibet, San Francisco against Seoul yet. Yeah. So. That, I think that's, that's actually a very important point, um, that um, the rewriting of the ROE, right, the rules of engagement after Chan'an, I think is something that the Chinese took very seriously too, um, that I think they saw that this was a South Korea that was not going to yeah, take, sit, sit there back. and take a punch. Right. Like yeah. you said, not local and not proportional. And I think um, to the extent they could with um, uh, the previous leader, they communicated that to the, to the North Koreans, that they really believed, uh, they really believed that. Um, can I offer just another uh, indicator that's probably a little less conventional, and maybe one that's not on the radar screen for a lot of your viewers, is I would also watch the Olympics. Uh, South Korea is hosting the Winter Olympics in February. Um, there was big news about how this weekend mm -hmm. a couple of North Korean figure skaters qualified for the games. I think the South Koreans are, you know, they're very focused on the Olympics. I mean, they've hosted them once before in 1988. It was a big event for them. Yeah. This is a very important event for them. I think it has two implications. One is in the run up to the games, the South Koreans are going to want very hard to try to maintain as much stability as possible vis-a-vis um, -vis North Korea, uh, try to reduce the tensions as much as they can. And two, they're going to use the Olympics or try to use it as a way to bring high-level North Koreans to South Korea. High-level right? North uh, Koreans. Yeah, to, to yeah. South Korea. Because to date, all the exchanges have been going north. It was South yes. Korean officials going across the border. Yes. The exception being the Asian Games yeah. that they hosted, what was in Busan? They yeah. Yeah. And there were three high-level North Korean officials I mean, the point of all this is that I, I think all these indicators are important, but 
one of the ones that I think you should, we should also be watching is what, are the, what is the news cycle leading up to the Olympics? I mean, is it, is it something that where the South Koreans are pushing very hard to try to make initiatives to the North to keep things quiet? Are, are there these things that we don't expect, like these no, two North Korean figure skaters qualifying for the games, if the North allows them to go? Because we don't know if the North will allow them to compete. The, these are all things that I think also help us to get a sense of the overall tension. Any, any informal noises being made about venues potentially north of the border? So I think it was in discussion for quite a bit of time. This, this liberal government in South Korea has tried to push that discussion much uh, further along than it is. Uh, for the IOC, that sort of conversation has to happen. We're way past the deadline from the perspective of the International Olympic Committee. But I think the South Korean government will hold out hope till the last possible, okay. the last possible minute. Right now, it's not in the cards, but you know. so you use the word hope. So let me. I want to ask one final question, then I actually offer each of you a chance to say things I didn't ask about and should have. All right. Um, there, we've all been to Korea. We know Korea. We, we love the Koreans. We love Korea. Uh, we know it's dangerous. Or we, we know there are tensions, but we know the bounds. We understand that. I mean, I've gotten phone calls from folks saying, I'm going to Seoul next week. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're going, yeah, it's yeah. fine. What, I'm headed there <laughs> next week. So. <laughs> so, so, so what are you telling our friends on the other side of the screen to, to say with regard to any irrational fears they may meet from their people, their investors, and others with whom they do business? Sort of well, like well, so, <laughs> so I... I um, well, I mean, I think the, the, we have to understand that in the, in the case of Korea, I mean, history has made it such that they're, they have a very unique situation in terms of their overall security situation. Yet it has not deterred for six or seven decades um, billions and billions of dollars of business, um, um, stability, um, and, uh, you know, fairly given what we're dealing with across the border, a fairly high degree of transparency in terms of what's going on, in terms of the overall situation. I don't think you could find any place in the world where you'd have this level of threat being discussed, but at the same time, still that much confidence in the business community and in others to continue to do, to do business there. So I've gotten the same phone calls as we all have, and, um, and you know, I find them, I understand them because the media is hyperventilating sometimes. Yeah. But at the same time, um, you know, I do believe that deterrence is held for seven decades, um, both in terms of overall war and, as Skip just mentioned, since 2010, in terms of some of these more conventional provocations. I, I, I agree. Uh, I, I think that uh, with the capabilities that the Republic of Korea has and the United States has and our other allies that are in the region that are part of the United Nations Command, it's a very strong deterrent capability that Kim Jong-un is not suicidal. Uh, and I think he will continue to push, uh, continue to try to get more and more capabilities. But I think the, uh, he's smart enough to know two things. Number one, an all-out attack would mean failure for him. And secondly, now even smaller kinetic attacks could bring Being real danger dangerous. on yeah. him as he goes through. And then the last piece I'll make is, I don't want to minimize this, but we have NEO plans around the world, non-combatant evacuation operations. I know of no place in the world where it's more rehearsed, more trained. <laughs> Huge problem because of the number of citizens, U.S. citizens and other allies that we would have to evacuate off. And yes, there would be, you know, if you went into a, short notice all out war scenario, it would be very dangerous and people would be killed. But we do have great, great plans along those lines to be able to hopefully get people out as quickly as possible. But I don't think we'll get to that point. Yeah. Any last concluding thoughts, Victor? Um, <clears throat> well, I, you know, again, I, I think that um, as while this situation often looks quite bad in the media and uh, the media likes to write a lot and to report a lot on the story just because of some of the um, things that are said between, uh, between the two sides. In the end, as Skip mentioned, we're talking about a regime in the North um, that's run by a dictator and the first and the last thing any dictator wants to do is survive. Uh, and so for that reason 
as young as this leader may be and as inexperienced um, the, this leadership may be, uh, they know there are certain lines that once they cross, they put that survival at risk. And, uh, and so in that sense, although some of the statements by President Trump um, seem a bit over the top, they are at the same time conveying a very strong deterrence signal to the North that I think is uh, uh, helps uh, at least maintain the understanding that there are certain lines that the North Korean regime can't cross. And uh, it's important for everybody to, to, to know that. Okay. The only thing I would add, I agree with all of that, is uh, I do think that it's, would, it is smart for companies to have plans in place. Uh, and they don't have to be sophisticated, but accountability of people. Know where your people. Know where your people are. Know to what degree you can. How do you work with the embassy if there is a non-combatant evacuation? How are you working with your Korean, you know, you know, counterparts that are there in country to be able to work together as you do through their having, you know, how do you do local types of, of things? And having a process in place that looks at these indicators and saying, okay, we need to ramp up to, instead of having a, a manning report every week, we want to do it every three days or something along those lines. And, yeah, we maybe not want to do this quite in, in the way we've been doing yeah. it in the past. Have some way to escalate the preparedness, I think, in a process that's already defined. Uh, I think that's worth doing in any part of the world, but especially here in Korea. Okay. Great. Skip Sharp, Victor Cha, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you all for joining us. This is from the Chertoff Group. Thank you and have a great afternoon.